that's going to be run one week from now. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. As some of you might not know, I'm in the computer engineering department. Very blessed to be here. And today I will be talking about some of the work we've been doing over the past several years on hybrid systems. And I tailored this talk to provide much of the details, mathematical details, behind the models. So the applications will be somewhat superficial, and I will get to some of those details. This is joint work with many of my students and my former PhD advisor, Andy Hill, at UC Santa Barbara, my collaborator, Rafael Gobo, at Loyola University. I wanted to start with some description of what these systems look like. We're talking about dynamical systems. That's the research area that I work with, and control theory. So we look at systems that have non-smooth dynamics, like for instance, this uh, juggling problem, where you have impacts between these balls and this robotic manipulator, and you can think that every time there is an impact, there is a very fast change of the, in velocities of those bodies, and that change can be modeled as a discontinuous change, as a jump in the system. So you can think about tracking control problems, balancing control problems. Uh, the one on the right top up here is a three-link pendulum, and um, one of the canonical examples in control theory is a single-link pendulum that you would like to balance. So basically, you'd like to control the tip of the pendulum and keep it in upright configuration. What you see right there is a movie that corresponds to three links, which is basically my arm without control in the elbow and on the wrist. So I only control the shoulder. And what the controller, the algorithm behind it is doing is trying to steer the links to a resting configuration from where you can do that particular maneuver of pumping energy into the system without steering the unstable zero dynamics. And basically, catch it at the top with a local control. So there is switching behind it because we solve the problem in individual steps and then we concatenate these algorithms in some systematic way. So what makes this one high burner non-discrete is you have jumps in the control? So the physics of the system, the three links, are basically continuous arms. Sure, this is a smooth right. flow and the algorithm behind it has switches in okay. the sense that I use different controllers at different portions of the technical okay. scales. Now, this is not necessarily a discontinuous right-hand side system, which we're going to talk about that. It's essentially a system with logic variables and timers, which might have overlapping conditions. So basically, exotic value of x with f discontinuous would not really cover the closed loop for this problem. Um, uh, this uh, circuit that you see right here, uh, or this circuit that you see right here, is a result of this control of an uh, inverter. Inverters are very popular. Um, and we use it all the time to convert almost constant voltage into sinusoidal voltage so we can use it for powering our devices. And what you see here is the essence behind hybrid, which is when the state of the system, in this case current and voltage, hit a particular region, which is these green circles, the, there is an algorithm that chooses different configuration of the transistors, pick different vector field, and it steers the red state of the system within this band. And the goal will be to reproduce this blue line that you see right here, a circle, purely sinusoidal signal, but that's impossible <coughs> with only this actuation, if you will. So you, you have to switch, and the way to switch, or one way to switch, is by using state trigger switching that, that corresponds to another hybrid system. Now, the one on the, on the right bottom, which is kind of popular these days, it's a drone flying, trying to follow a particular maneuver. It's also one of those cases where you have, again, smooth dynamics, but what happens is that this system, when you describe it mathematically, is a system on a manifold. And if you would like to stabilize a point on a manifold, you can't do that robustly with a, a smooth feedback. You need to have a discontinuous feedback. And once you have discontinuous feedback, then you might have issues with chattering. So what we're actually doing here is modeling the system on a manifold, designing a controller that is somewhat discontinuous but in the right way, in the hybrid sense, and stabilizing not only a point but a trajectory. And on top of that, you have under actuation into the system. You, know, you cannot put this vehicle in any orientation or position uh, as you will. So you need to deal with basically how the torque can be applied to the system. And there are some problems that are being generic networks. People, biologists in particular, think about these systems as 
differential equations that depend on the state of Boolean variables, whether they are on and off, and those Boolean variables change from on and off depending on thresholds corresponding to gene concentration or protein concentration depending on the molecule. And it turns out that you can think about this as a feedback loop where this is inhibiting growth and this is enhancing or um, encouraging growth. And what you end up having for certain parameters, you end up having limit cycles with jumps. So you can think about the idea of point carré maps. Now with trajectories that have also jumps, perhaps three jumps after some flow, and then periodically continue. So th there's a richness behavior or dynamics in these systems that are hybrid. I'm going to define hybrid in a minute, but let me just say that most of these systems, which again are from science and engineering, have variables that change continuously, like the physics of these links or the position of the vehicle, and also have variables that change abruptly, like the impact, you can model that change in the velocity very impactful, and you can think of that being a discontinuous or a jump into the system. Or you could have changes in the environment or control decisions, maybe because there is a fault in the system and then the output that you are looking at all of a sudden disappears and you need to have a monitor and pick the right algorithm to cope with what you're measuring at the current time. So there are a lot of interesting systems that you can model. I will not go into those details. I will try to extract the mathematics behind them. And actually what we've been doing for a number of years is trying to find ways to think about these systems as control theoretical problems for which we can use systematic tools, in particular the Apple stability theory, in order to analyze the stability of particular sets for these systems. Okay. We're going to move away from the origin for several reasons. I'm going to mention that. I'm going to capture the dynamics for the flow motion, the continuous motion, and for the discrete part, the jump part, okay, with models. So this is model-based control. We're going to do study some of the properties of what we mean by solutions of these systems. One needs to define it. It's not for free that solutions exist for our, for our time, whatever time means. And then we will need to analyze somehow properties of those systems, like particular stability, robustness. More recently, we've been looking at forward invariance, which are properties that are useful for safety and optimality. And then something I won't get into detail, but you will see the plot, that there's also a challenge here how to simulate the system, how to get numerical results that you can trust, in particular because you end up with solutions to differential equations with jumps. And those jumps occurring at very slightly different time instances might trigger or might lead to totally different behaviors. So you need to be careful about how to simulate these systems. And we've done some progress on that. And we have um, approaches going on that. So over the past few years, we've been doing work on autonomous hybrid systems, systems without inputs. And I will spend maybe 80% of my time on that. And then more recently on non-autonomous systems that have inputs. And I would like to figure out a way to systematically design the control feedback. Think about this as a a way to synthesize a proportional integral derivative controller for the type of systems is something that we have. Uh, and that led to a number of hybrid control design strategies. <clears throat> and then we came up with MathWorks and we came up with a toolbox that is available for free. At this stage, they are not paying for it. Hopefully that changes soon. But um, you can actually pull this toolbox from MATLAB Central and simulate pretty academic, simple, low dimensional systems and trust the simulation system. So when Richard visited me a few weeks or a month ago, gave him a copy of this. And I wrote a copy of this. So don't keep inviting me. I keep giving you things to read. <laughs> um, but um, the idea would be to see if we can find some common grounds on things <clears throat> that would be mathematical interest, which is one of my main things. So today we're talking about notion of solution. What do we mean by solutions? What do we mean by stability? What do we mean by robustness? And I will give a hint of control the output of functions on how to synthesize feedback from the existence of such functions. Okay. So here's where um, I, need, I like to relate to the research in, in the literature, but this is a rather incomplete literature. If any, anyone has looked at how many ways there exist to model a hybrid system, there are many ways, and there are many uh, definitions of hybrid 
Okay. I just pick some of the ones that are most related to the way we work, which is to some extent from a control theoretical viewpoint. Okay. Actually, it's not that we claim, but we actually try to make hybrid systems look like x dot equal f of x comma u, or x plus equal f of x comma u if it was discrete time, as much as possible. Okay, which is a uniqueness of our approach. So if we look back at the literature, there are a few references. There is one article by Witzenhaus in Transactions and Automatical Control, which is the main journal in control theory, that actually was one of the first ones that includes differential equation with Boolean variables for a power system network. Okay? So this is what is, is called multi-stable elements, this on and off type of system. In my opinion, one of the breakthroughs was when a computer scientist, Lucio Tavernini, came up with the idea of looking at finite state machines, which are considered some sort of discrete time system, even though there is no notion of time associated to it, with differential equations. So basically he said, if I have a machine which is basically different modes of operation, and in each mode of operation I throw in a differential equation, then I'm going to have something I call a differential automata. Okay. So to me, that was kind of the, the first <coughs> main contribution to hybrid system, which then was taken by a number of groups. And I remember in our discussions, uh, I think Richard was exposed uh, by the group of uh, Shankar Sastri when uh, he was at Berkeley. Uh, so this is John Liberos, Claire Tom, Lily Shankar Sastri, and many PhD students working on hybrid automata. So basically, if you compare it to what Tavernini did, it's an extension of adding differential equations to each mode, but also now, when you transition, be able to reset or change abruptly the state of the system or the state of the machine. Okay. So you can model a bunch of things with that. At the same time, the group of um, uh, Michael Branicki, uh, Sanjoy Nitter at MIT came up with their own formalism, so there is another transaction of theory in 1988. That was more motivated from the viewpoint of switch systems, which we're going to mention. And switch systems are slightly less general in our context than hybrid systems. And then there's another group that made a lot of contribution, Arjen Valdershaw, um, in the Netherlands, and Schumacher, came up with a first book. This is the first book on hybrid systems, and a very nice book. It's a very small book where you can learn about things like multiple pendulums colliding, or the Newton's cradle type of system, or some control-oriented problems as well. So we built a lot of intuition from this, and also from work in the literature of impulse differential equations that appear from the Russian literature, and also the group of Wasim Haddad at Georgia Tech, working in particular with optimal control problems for systems with impulse. Um, certainly there are a lot of systems or models with discontinuities in the mechanical systems literature. Body impact has been studied for many, many years. Actually, it's what it started uh, so Moreau has a, long, a number of results in measure-driven differential equations, where now you have different measures, and then control, optimal control problems, which is used by Richard Winter, that's what we can use in case. And then there are all the mechanical-oriented models, like Ileda, constraints in the system, that are done by uh, Bernardo Riaz and Sam So these are kind of our precursors, and when we look at this, uh, this is back in 2004, 2005, we wonder, can you say something about robustness to the systems? In other words, the natural question of if I perturb the initial condition slightly, will I get a trajectory that looks pretty much the same or is close in some sense? So we start looking at this from a point of view of control theory. So we said, okay, <laughs> let's take a state space, let's say it's our RM uh, including an of dimension n or any open set. Let's take an initial condition. If I would be looking to a continuous time system, I would be looking at trajectories of this form. If I would be looking to a discrete time system, I would be looking at trajectories of this form. So to me, a combination of continuous and discrete will generate trajectories that are of this form. Okay, so you have flows, jumps, maybe you flow forever, maybe you jump more than once at a common time instantly. And you can think about all different variations. So these are kind of the misbehaviors in my talk. How can we model this? Well, if I were to, again, control engineering, control theoretical approach, think about this as the solution of a differential equation, and think about this as the solution of a difference equation, but just one step. Okay? So that's essentially what we're going to be looking at here. 
So we're going to be looking at equations or inclusions. We're going to go call them hybrid. And we're going to have a state variable, which is a state in a dimension Rn, that will have all the variables that I need to represent the dynamics of my system. And I will say that whenever I have the flow behavior, I will be evolving according to this differential equation, maybe dependent on some input that is applied to the system. Okay. And whenever there is a reset or a jump, I will have a reset of the state variable x instantaneously, there is no discretization here, as in discrete time systems, to a value that corresponds to the current state and the current input. Okay? And maybe they generate some output. So we'll call this the flow map and the jump map. Okay? The question now is when these behaviors are allowed, and that's kind of what made our approach uh, unique. We actually throw in basically two conditions. This set C and this set D define where these behaviors are possible. Okay? These sets can overlap. In other words, you can have points in the state the space where you can have non-uniqueness of solutions. But basically what I would say is that flow is only allowed whenever the state, and maybe the input, if the input appears there, belongs to this set. And whenever I'm in X uh, and D, um, then the, tra the trajectory is going to have a jump. Okay? So these are the flow set and the jump set. Okay? And there is an output map. For reasons of robustness and also to capture non-uniqueness in control algorithms, we may need to have inclusions here. So basically the velocity of the state could be coming from a set, or the new value of the state could be coming from a set as well. Okay? And if that brings any issues with speed equality, but all the results pretty much generalize as long as you have the right regularity on these maps in the sense of continuity for set value maps. Okay? <clears throat> so how can we parameterize time for this type of system? Well, we're going to say that whenever the blue flow occurs, I'm going to increment ordinary time t. And I'm going to insist that this is with time equals zero, but you can change that to any initial time if you want. And every time there is a jump that I increment this j counter by one. Okay? Then you can think about solutions to these systems. Calligraph H will be the hybrid system that given an input and a state variable trajectory, now you have definitions of these objects in amount of flow, 0 to t1, indexed by 0 jumps. And if there is a jump at time t1, amount of flow t1 to t2, and then another jump, and then so on. So these are union of closed intervals that are indexed by j. Notice that I'm closing this. So I can actually define the left and the right limits of these functions at those points. If I were to use only t, I would have a problem. I would need to make a decision. It would be continued from the right or left continue from the left. Um, so I need to make that choice, but let's say that we keep that there. But um, uh, the state x can have also variables that I didn't explain or explicitly mention at this point, but think about this as being the closed loop system of my three-link pendulum, which has at least six, six variables, two per link. And then I will have a logic variable that says which controller I'm going to use. So I will have seven variables. And that logic variable during continuous motion will not change. So its derivative will be trivial equal to zero. But every time that there is a reset, the variable will be changed to the right number that corresponds to which controller to use. Okay, so you can think about that being embedded into the x. And that could be a subset of Rn, or you can refine that space if you want. Again, they are all embedded into Rn. This could be manifolds embedded in Rn. And then another thing, you can have memory states and timer components. Like, for instance, some of these variables might just blow up to infinity in infinite amount of time. Okay? But you might probably just care about certain variables of this kind. So this is where we put everything together into the picture that I had before. And now I put in these areas where blue is allowed, flow is allowed, that's the flow set, projected onto the state space of the system. Again, there might be an input dependency. And then whenever there is red, it's because I'm in this one. Okay. So that's the pictorial description of the solution. And the new values after the jump should be in the jump map, evaluated at the value of the state and the input before. And then the differential equation should be the one that uh, the solutions are defined. So can, can you do a validation between the normal and the extra jumping? Right. So, if I'm talking about now uniqueness of solutions, then I need to figure out myself what's happening in the overlap region. So basically, if you want to have uniqueness of solutions on the overlap region, you shouldn't be able to flow because you can always jump. Okay, so basically, you can have a condition that this is just a set of measures zero 
and then the flow map points outside that region, so you cannot flow. But but let me keep keep that in the back of your mind because non-uniqueness is something that we sometimes need to embrace because of robotics. <coughs> Do you sometimes want to get theorem C and D to be compact or convex or something, or you're just kind of arbitrary setups? The structure on those would be needed. As much as we're going to ask is closeness, uh -huh. for reasons that will come up. But we will not require, in general, convexity or boundaries. Certainly, if you like to prove that you have an stability property, then you will need to have that the solutions do not escape a sub-level set of some positive definite function with respect to something, subset of C and D. So this is how a trajectory or a solution to the system would look like, given initial condition x, 0, 0. Then the solution will flow. So that would be this first piece right here. And then when it jumps, you increment the counter. And then it flows again. And then at this very point, jumps again. And then maybe you have two jumps. So this function of t and j is defined on a specific elements t and j. Okay, this is a particular structure and that's the inner ball index of ij that I mentioned before. Okay. We're gonna give that a name in a little bit. Let me just talk about a few examples so that we can kind of relate to this. This is one of the canonical hybrid control problems or hybrid systems without input if you make the input equal to zero or this to be the ground. But this is essentially the baby version of the movie I showed you earlier. Let's say the motion of the ball, the position is x1, and u is basically the position of this manipulator. Okay, we're just controlling position. It could be controlling velocity. Okay, so if you use basic principles, then you end up that the second derivative of position, which is acceleration, is equal to minus the gravity, minus maybe some friction, which will be viscous friction, depending on velocity, where this is the coefficient of friction. And then you can define the velocity as the derivative of the position. Okay, so this is position and this is velocity. Okay. When is this differential equation uh, um, allowed? This is basically when x1 is away from you, <laughs> so when the ball is over the, the floor, moving floor. You can have the other situation when it's below, but let's say we don't worry about that. And this leads to this differential equation where this x2 vector with minus gamma minus dx2 would define my flow map. We know input in this case, okay? However, the flow set has an input dependency, okay? So you can write this as a set of points x and u such that x1 is larger than u. So that would be your flow set. The jumps, you can model in many ways, but basically the jump will occur whenever x1 and u match, and whenever x2 is pointing down. So the ball is pointing down, so x2 is negative. And at that very moment, you need to make a decision what's going to happen with the energy of the ball, so if you use a Newton type of impact law, basically what you have with some restitution coefficient e, that x1 does not change, the height does not change, there's no compression being modeled, but x2 changes its sign, and its magnitude is decreased by this factor of e, the restitution coefficient. So this is basically keeping potential energy constant and kinetic energy being strictly decreased. Okay. So you can prove actually that the energy, the total energy for this system is actually the um, the uh, potential that's kinetic. And this is what you would model with, I like to carry these things, unless my son steals them from my dad. Um, this bouncing ball, that's basically what we are modeling, right? So you're modeling that behavior, and you would like to figure out the dynamics, so this is one case. And one thing that you probably notice when I throw it is that eventually the ball comes to rest. Now if you, which you're more familiar with these things, if you run this restitution with zero energy dissipation in between flies, you will realize that you need to apply the restitution infinitely many times in order to have convergence to zero. In other words, you need to have infinitely many impacts to have convergence to zero energy in this model. Again, it's a rough model, but what it says is that in finite ordinary time, the world will come to rest after infinitely many jumps. One other type of situation, and this is a trajectory for a control problem. Now, take this to the control case. As you would like to probably give in a reference trajectory, and that's what the, what the movie was doing, try to control the impact so that after, let's say, one, two, and three impacts, you are tracking the reference trajectory. Now I can throw another ball, 
and separate these references and keep track in multiple boards. Okay. So the dynamics of the plant here is our hybrid, the controller that we're using is hybrid because the structure that we propose and we can guarantee tracking. Another example is the so-called boost converter. In a boost converter, which most of these computers run, you basically take a constant voltage and you amplify that voltage by a particular factor. Okay. So you generate high DC voltage output. I will not go to the details, but you can think about different configurations of this circuit. One of them is when the diode is uh, on and this switch is off, which corresponds to the circuit. They can write down the differential equations. And the other one is when this switch is, is on and the diode is <coughs> off, and then you end up with this other circuit, and then other circuits. The idea of this circuit is basically the following. Whenever this configuration is, is what the circuit <coughs> operates, the capacitor is going to provide all the power or the voltage to the load. And whenever we put this in series, this inductor will essentially change its voltage and add the voltage at the input with the voltage on the inductor because it wants to continue the current being in this direction. So once you do that, you end up with a high voltage here, and that's what actually makes the amplification. So it's a matter of how you switch this, and many people have looked at this from an optimal control problem, how to actually solve that. So you can write down the differential equations, which again, are not very difficult. You end up with a second order system on voltage at the capacitor and current at the inductor, okay? And then, one thing that you actually solve when you solve the boost control problem is giving a desired output voltage and a related current output, so you're giving these two values, you need to find a way to switch this switch so that you converge to the point okay, in the limit. <coughs> now, the switch has zero and one values. So I could say this is a logic variable that I can switch around. And now I would like to stabilize the set of points I, L, B, C, and the logic variable, call it S, such that I, L is equal to I, L star, and B, C is equal to B, C, B, C star. So you're stabilizing a set that is not necessarily a singleton. Because now the extra variable that you add, you don't care where it is. It will be in on and off for the switch. Um, and you are actually looking at general sets. So the problems of the stabilization for hybrid systems actually require, to some extent, looking at um, um, sets in general. This is another problem I'm going to skip it, but this is the, there's some popularity on distributed problems, distributed systems, right? So this is a synchronization of multi agents with linear dynamics. This could be nonlinear, but the idea would be that over a graph, you would like to use information that appears at certain events, so you have certain events, and when those events occur, you actually update your control signal in order to steer this states to a particular synchronization configuration. And in this case, you also would like to actually, in this case, you would like to have a diagonal stabilization type problem. You want everybody to synchronize. So it's the diagonal in the dimension of the network. And you have also potentially logic virus, memory states, and whatnot. Okay, so all this is to motivate what I'm going to tell you in a slide, but <laughs> let me just say that there are other classes of systems. So switch system is one class. In a switch system, you have a family of vector fields which is chosen by a switch signal, okay? So this is basically a discontinuous right-hand side problem where the discontinuity occurs based on the values of a switch signal, which is an exogenous signal. You also have impulsive systems. And let me just say that this switching signal could belong to a family of dual time switching, so you have some time in between every switching or average dual time, in some window you have this many switches and so on. So people have studied this from many angles. So this is a switch system type of uh, research. The impulsive system is very close to what we are doing, but the catch is that the events are triggered by time. So in other words, you end up with the autonomous system where the events depend on ordinary time. You can embed that into the hybrid model that I mentioned using a timer variable as long as you know the time where the impacts or the jumps will occur. But that requires knowing when the jumps are going to occur, which is difficult in general. Differential algebraic equations here appear very much in power systems all the time, or mechanical systems, and you end up with constraints that depend on the state of the system and maybe some other parameters. And that parameter could be a logic variable. So you might end up with jumps when you switch from different consistency spaces for the differential equations from one to another. 
And then we have the automata framework, which I mentioned earlier. This is basically, we love the dynamics here, where we define a display machine. We have conditions based on inputs, typically, where you can navigate through the modes. And the idea is to add differential equations to here and also transition resets at each of the modes. So you're giving a graph, you're giving a bunch of vector fields and a bunch of preset maps, and then you need to stabilize the system. That approach is powerful, but it's more from a computer science approach. You can actually write this down as a hybrid inclusion by properly defining the states and the flow map and the term map versus the term map. So let me introduce how we are going to um, think about this problem. So we're given a system. This could be, again, a hybrid plan, or it could be a closed loop system without the inputs. Um, we would like to stabilize a set, OK? Maybe design a feedback. And we want like to stabilize a set. And again, that set might not be just the origin. So we like to do stability of sets. Um, we put it in the context of the system projected, projected on the RM space. This is the set A that we like to stabilize. This is my flow set, this is my jump set projected. I would like to have the property that if my solutions occur close to A, they stay close to A. So basically, for every epsilon, there exists a delta, false positive, such that if I start within delta of the set, my trajectories during flows and during jumps stay within epsilon of the set. Okay, typically epsilon is larger than delta, but we can find cases where there are limits. That would be the apple of stability. <coughs> you would also like to have convergence or attractivity to the set. Okay. So the question that comes here is if the solution exists for a very long time. So assuming that the solution exists for arbitrarily long t or j, which is our parameter now, I would like that as the uh, t or j go to infinity, that the solution gets closer to the attractor a. Now, the if exists is an important question, so we're going to look into that. Let me just say that if you have a closed loop system, then the input goes away. Okay, so I assign your input. It could be that you start with some state, the feedback is a dynamic feedback, and then you have another state, you put it back together into X, and this will be my closed loop system, maybe in a larger space, but at the end of the day, this will be my closed loop system. So I would like to focus more, mostly on this and tell you a little bit of what would be the control. So the first thing I like to introduce is the structure of these domains. So we call these hybrid time domains. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not much more than saying that um, a set is written as the union of closed intervals indexed by j. Okay. However, we do this in a step called compact hybrid time domain because we pick an element of the set, and then for that element of the set, we need to be able to write that with this particular compact structure, and that will lead us to a hybrid time domain. I have, I have a picture here earlier that will be famous for time. Yeah. So, so see, this, this domain might be unbounded because this can continue flowing. But I would like to have the project that every time I pick an element in the green, whatever I have before that hybrid time can be written as the union of closed intervals indexed by j. Okay. So every time I pick an element, I end up with a compact hybrid time domain. Okay. But, but it's still okay to have infinitely many of them with a, with an accumulation. Correct. So then can you go on beyond that accumulation point? I'll tell you a little bit about that. We presented that at the, CC, at the CDC in December. It's tricky. It's tricky. Okay, so now how am I going to define the trajectories over this hybrid time domain? So the hybrid time domain would be denoted as the domain of the function. So that would be a hybrid time domain. And then the function itself, the one that I'm plotting on the green, would be a function that, as a function of t for each fixed j, has a reasonable derivative almost everywhere. So we pick locally absolutely continuous functions on the intervals of t such that for a given j, t and j belong to the domain. Basically, we slice for every j this domain. And then we can write down the definition of a solution to this system. Again, closed loop system. So you can do the same with the input. It's more involved. But given an initial point in the set C union D where things exist, Okay, then what I would like to have is that during flows, if this function x in a hybrid time domain, which we call hybrid arc, I think I missed to say that, but these are hybrid arcs, just locally absolutely continuous uh, for each j, um, satisfy the differential equation and the constraint. Okay, 
So basically, the differential equation is saying that the derivative with respect to time of this function is in the right hand side, which may be set value for almost all t's, okay, because of how often they can change. And then that the condition during flows is almost also satisfied on the set c. Okay. And here is close, open, you can actually change this slightly and without altering too much the notion and the solution that you get. Everything will pretty much get simpler, and you can do <coughs> that from the book when C and D are closed. These issues kind of, this notation kind of simplifies a little bit when the sets are closed because you don't need to worry about the boundary points. The jump condition will correspond to um, uh, the arc having a jump, meaning that if E and J belong to the domain, also T and J plus one belong to the domain, okay? So for the same T. And when that happens, the arc needs to be in the, in the and the new value of the arc needs to be coming from the evaluation of the jump map at the jump event, at the jump value x and j. Okay. So that's, um, that's something to think about. Now, the definition of solution doesn't say that this value might land very far away from C union D. Okay? So when I was saying attractivity, I will only care about solutions that have arbitrary E and J in their domain, or T or J in their domain, because I might have solutions that pretty much jump out with C union D. They misbehave. That solution that is maximal is all I can get. Okay. So somehow, if I want to guarantee that every maximal solution, which is the most extendable solution from an initial condition, is complete in the sense that has either T or J unbounded, I will need to make sure that the values of G evaluated on D are in C union D. <coughs> okay, so you can write down those conditions. So let me just say these type of solutions model a bunch of type of behaviors. So flow, so pick D empty, C entire state space, you get a continuous time system. So we don't kill what we know. Discrete time systems or discrete solutions, pick C empty D to be entire state, which is jump, okay? Eventually continuous after a few number of flow jumps and so on, you just flow. Eventually discrete after some flow jump, you just jump. And key is the one that I mentioned earlier. After a bunch of impacts, the time in between impacts, because in the ball, the energy gets smaller and smaller, goes to zero. And you can compute that as a series that converges to the sum converges to time, we call sino time, coming from the sino paradox. So how do we guarantee existence? You look at this, well, I would like to call non-trivial solutions, solutions that at least have some evolution, a little bit of flow or a one jump, at least something, otherwise the solution is trivial. Okay. So if the initial point that you pick <coughs> is indeed, then it's non-trivial because you can jump. As long as G is defined on D, which should be part of the definition of G, then you can jump. Whether it jumps to some somewhere good or not, that's the question. Not empty. Okay, so x01 belongs to G of the initial condition, so provides an empty solution. And the domain will be 00 linear 0, 01, at least. Okay, hopefully you can extend that. Or if it's not in D, you have a open type viability condition. In other words, you have a solution for some epsilon amount of time to your differential inclusion with a constraint. How to check this is hard, as you see, but if you have f to be regular enough and c regular enough close and our semi continuous, then you can use tangent cones for that. Okay. In that case, you have a solution that goes for some time <coughs> with zero jumps and some <coughs> interval of flexibility. So that will, if you guarantee these two conditions, which is again simple to check in general, you have that for every point in C union D, you have a solution that does something. Now the question is under what condition does solution will continue flowing and jumping and have either T or J infinity. So if DC holds for every point in C minus D, then there exists an non-trivial solution for every point in C union D, because from D you can always jump. And each maximal solution will only satisfy one of the following. It's either complete, in the sense that the domain of X is unbounded, T or J direction. Either blows, blows up to infinity, in finite amount of time, so finite escape time, typically non-locally lived just right hand side. Which is quite far fetched. Or it jumps outside of C union D. Okay? 
So you can rule this out by making sure that G maps back to where you want. And you can make sure by this by showing that there's no final scale point. And then that will give you a complete one size solution. Okay. So make it that easy. Back to the bouncing ball, my favorite example. Let me just say something about this. I removed the input and I just wrote the maps and the set. So this is how you can write them without the input or the input equal to zero. So this is just the, the floor. Just the floor, just this yeah. experiment right here, right? Okay. And now I like to plot this. So this is what actually our toolbox gives you. In MATLAB, you can simulate this, give you an initial condition for position and velocity. This is what happens. And this is a single time, around four seconds. Okay, you can only compute up to a certain number of jumps. So we provide a horizon for flow, a horizon for jump, and let the machine work. <coughs> if you look at the position, this is what you expect, right? The accumulations occur. But now something that makes this problem interesting is when you look at the velocity. When you look at the velocity, you see that this is where the higher behavior appears, right? This is, again, very approximated model of things that the velocity goes from negative going down to positive going up, and that's what happens. Now, what happens if I now perturb the initial condition? Okay, so that's my initial predictor. I just plot a little bit, and then this is the perturb initial condition, just the velocity. The point-wise distance between these two arcs is nice all the way to here. At this point, it jumps to the error between the blue and the dash already within the blue, which is large. So if you were to plot the point-wise distance, which I should probably have done it, you get a close to epsilon and then a peak, close to epsilon and a peak. And that occurs and happens for the entire accumulation horizon. So you don't have a decrease in point-wise distance for a well-behaved point-wise distance. This suggests that we will need to exploit, and this is actually why we use D and J, <coughs> the fact that now I can just look at these trajectories, perturb and unperturb, for the same J. And I can put neighborhoods around the perturb trajectory, and if I contain the unperturb, for the neighborhood, I would say that these are close graphically. It turns out that that's how we're going to use distance. We're going to define graphical closeness by distance between <coughs> sets using set conversion idea. So given a tau, which will define the horizon for flow and jumps and an epsilon, I would like to say that two arcs, x and y, are tau epsilon close. <coughs> if for every dj in the domain of x, such that p plus j is less or equal than tau, this makes the box compact, then there exists an s, which is a time instant in the domain of y that is epsilon close to the t, such that the arc values are epsilon away. Okay? And then the dual attack for every element in, a, in y or x. This would be made independent of this, but it doesn't make much of a difference. The idea is, again, having these arcs to be able to put a neighborhood around, and up to, so after, up to some time, somewhere around here, I will have those contained. So the first <coughs> thing I would like to have is if in <coughs> compact horizons, hybrid horizons in this case, I have these closures. So okay. If I look at the solutions as the um, images in what we call hybrid time cross state space, that the same as saying the Hausdorff distance is closer well, is a little stronger. It is it is close to the Hausdorff distance, yes. If you look at each J. And I wanted to look at it in the whole cross product of kind of Z, R, and state space. C R. So your hybrid time cross state space. Hybrid time? Yeah. The so it's plot. It's plot, right? It's yeah, plot. yeah, same plot. Yeah. So, and then I take the Hausdorff distance around the network. And then it's closer to that. Well, yes, it, but because it's just a distance between the sets, right? However, distance, whatever distance you want to use, it will be squeezable by epsilon, I would imagine, right. and it will work. Okay. Okay. Now, what is closer to this is the Scorahaus distance. Or the metric, the score hot metric 
Okay. Maybe I'm not pronouncing it the right way because it's not from Russia, I guess. <laughs> um, but there are four metrics that you can use also to actually characterize distance between arc. Uh, this metric came from a stochastic processes where you also have jumps. Okay. The reason we are using um, graphical distance as defined here is because now I can treat every arc that defines a solution as a set, and then I can use set convergence tools from basically Rockefeller and Wet to prove that this sequence of sets either converges or diverges to infinity. And actually, this is the motivation of the following result, for which we need to put some regularity on this object. So we have a hybrid system H. We're going to pick C to be close and D to be close. Okay? And F and G, these are single value continuous maps. If there are set value, then I'm going to have that set value map F is outer semi-continuous, is locally bounded on C, and non-empty and convex value for every element in C. Okay? If you're familiar with differential equations with this continuous right-hand side, if you get a F that is not continuous, that is discontinuous, and you do a Philip over a Krasovsky regularization to this right-hand side, which is a convexification and closure process, then you end up with a set value map that satisfies these conditions. Okay? So this is what we actually would need in order to apply the ideas of Philippov saying that you have robustness for these continuous time systems. And the idea was, if you have this continuous time system, then you prove everything for the regularized system. So you look at this differential inclusion. And if you prove the differential inclusion, which is sometimes tough, but it is what it is, then you can say that you have a small robustness to perturbations. So back to your question, that's essentially what we need to do here. Uh, C being closed is almost like a regularization process. Actually, you can define Herms, Krasovsky um, solutions and Philippov solutions to the systems and make a relationship about their limits. And we did that as well. Um, the, the jump map G will be defined um, uh, as a set value map to be our semi-continuous, locally bounded and non empty. You don't need the convexity here because you're not taking the derivative of the density. And if you're not familiar with our semi-continuity, basically our semi-continuity is a map whose graph is closed. So this is the sine function single value. It's not closed, so it's not our semi-continuous. And this is the sine function set value at the origin is closed, it's graph. So it's our semi-continuous, it's graph, it's closed. Okay. So under these conditions, which are mild, do not depend on solutions, just on the data of the system, you can prove using the tools and this tau epsilon closeness distance or graphical distance the following. If you have a hybrid system and that satisfies hybrid basic conditions and you have a sequence of solutions with initial condition that converges, okay, then you can extract from that a subsequence that converges to a solution to the system in the graphical sense, in the sense that this epsilon goes to zero at T and J goes to zero. It's not true. So if so you So you want to, you take a sequence of solutions, yeah. and then you modify so the distance? You basically, you take a look at the small neighbors of, of the initial data, and then you, you let it flow, right? And then you get a solution. But that will sweep out the kind of neighbors of it. Sweep out meaning will be contained within. Uh, but there are neighbors of it, so of the, of the one solution. And you have a parameter of family of solutions. Yeah. Then you sweep out that. Just keep checking of the distance, how, how the distance change for each slice. We don't have a way to keep track of the distance. Okay. No. So that's too much of us to ask. Okay. Now that I know. We know that it converges to zero in the limit. Yeah. When you take the limit of the sequence of solutions. But you cannot keep checking of one parameter of in general, I don't know how to do it. Okay. Because <coughs> this is sort of uh, you treat it as a set of both them. Yeah. More general. Right. Again, general. because we are looking at the linear process, if we would know somehow an upper bound or a lower bound on the distance, then maybe probably we can do that. Maybe we can discuss that. 
Um, let's take the, a look at the bouncing ball again. So the idea is, now I take a sequence of solution to the bouncing ball with initial condition converging to zero. What happens is that now my zero time will be a smaller and a smaller, right? And in the limit of this sequence of solutions which are maximal and bounded, I have that everything converts to just jumping. So if you remember my jump set was x1 equal to zero, x2 less or equal than zero when I rewrote it, but I could have written x2 less than zero, meaning that the origin is not in the jump set. So if the origin is not in the jump set, and you realize that from zero, minus gravity doesn't let you flow at zero, actually x1 dot equal to x2, x2 dot equal minus gravity at zero has a trivial solution with the constraint of c being x1 larger or equal than zero because it will always try to push you away from zero, then you realize that you need to have the solution that always jumps. So that implies that this jump set should be a closed set. <coughs> but in, again, if so you're the limit solution, it just jumps, but it will stay at zero. Correct. Okay. So basically what we're saying now is that with this framework, we are converging to just jumping. Which yeah, points out- jumps not at all. You don't just, <laughs> don't just, yeah, so it just uh, iterates on zero. Which right. brings up the question of, can I model what happens beyond zero time? So basically what we need to do is to extend the notion of hybrid time domain so that after I have a zero time, I have another hybrid time domain. Because basically, once I converge, I exhaust my time, right? It's like limit of exponential of minus t, t go to infinity, I'm done. I have reached my limit of my time horizon. So what we actually did in this paper, and we committed to Siam, the idea is that now we have a sequence of hybrid time domains. And every time that you reach Sino, you actually continue with the sequence. So we will continue with the next hybrid time domain. And then when you reach another Sino, so now you can model like a, a stair with a ball with horizontal velocity that accumulates and then rolls and accumulates and then rolls. You have potentially infinitely many infinitely Sino events. The catch is that how do you transition or how do you transfer the result of upper semi-continuity with respect to initial condition I just show you. So basically you need to have a limit in order to do that. And the limit needs to depend in an upper semi-continuous fashion, which is tough because the omega limit set for solution is badly depending from initial conditions. So uh, more to be said, I think I'm running out of material uh, time, but not a material. Um, let me just say that uh, stability will be given for a compact set, okay, and I'm going to uh, just restrict to that for the time being. For each epsilon there exists delta such that if I start within delta then the solution stays within epsilon, that's what graphically was defined earlier. So you can define all these um, similarly to continuous or discrete time system. Um, the Ferry maximum solution is bounded and if it's complete then the limit as t or j goes to infinity which you can write as the sum of t and j going to infinity is equal to zero in the sense of the distance to the set is equal to zero. So that's a mean that the solution has a limit, but the distance has a limit. And it's entotically free when you have both, okay? So this is the result, and again, I wish I had more time to go through it, but I will say that I said A, which, sorry, close would work as well, but I just don't want to get too technical. Uh, closer would work as well. Um, would be asymptotically stable, let me speak to the three for a second. If the function that I'm looking at here, which is the so-called Lyapunov function, is continuous and positive definitely with respect to that set, and I can take derivatives in open sets where I can flow, okay? So it can be relaxed with just being locally Lipschitz, and it requires using Clark's generalized derivative or whatnot. But the main idea is that whenever you take the change of V, which you can write down as the inner between the gradient of V, which exists in C, and the directions of vector field, you have a less or equal change. And whenever you have flow, which is away from the set of interest, you have a strict decrease, okay? So these blue conditions will correspond to the standard Lyapunov conditions for differential inclusions with constraints in this case. And every time that there is a jump, or every time that you're in the jump set, the value of V minus the value uh, at X, so the value of V after the jump minus the value before is not 
uh, larger than zero. And if you want to have convergence, then you need to have this is tricky case. Okay. Now, this, um, this is a solution independent condition, infinitesimal condition, but implies that if you now look at any solution to that system, you have the property of convergence. And this pre here is something to emphasize that solutions that are maximal might not be complete. Okay, but if you know that every maximal solution is complete because you check the existence condition con uh, result, then we will be matching one to one to the literature of dynamical systems, where asymptotic stability is somehow under the underlying assumption that every maximal solution is complete. But in this case, it's a little bit more uh, subtle. Okay. You can relax that a little bit if you now impose the hybrid basic conditions. The zero result doesn't have any assumption. These objects can be ugly. Okay, all we need to have is a nice indicator. But if you now put the hybrid basic conditions, you can get away from less or equal than zero with less or equal than zero alone, which buys stability, by the way. If you now have a property on invariance. So in other words, whenever you study in a level set of the function B that is away from the zero level set, you cannot stay. So generally, if that's the case, then you need to decrease. Okay. So this set should not allow any complete solution. And then you can further, so that's an invariant function, you can further um, use the decrease of being weak by exploiting properties of omega limit sets. So if you grab a bounded and complete solution and you compute the set of accumulation points now in the hybrid terms, so you put the omega limit set, under the hybrid basic conditions, you can show that that set is dynamically compact and invariant in a weak sense, in the sense that for every point, there exists a solution that is complete and stays forward in time and backward in time. So under that condition then, well, if I now pick a bounded and complete solution, then there should be an omega limit set. Where is that omega limit set? Well, that idea of LaSalle and Krasovsky and whatnot. The idea is that if you have a Lyapunov inequality condition that is weak, then all you need to do is to look at the set of points where the set of points x such that this is equal to zero, the set of points where this is equal to zero, intersect with a level set of B for a constant R, and that's where it's going to converge. The catch is what is R. And typically we would like R to be zero, so we converge to the attractor A. So this requires com computing solutions. So it's not a necessarily solution independent result, but that's what you pay for when you don't have a strict Lyapunov condition. And you can do that because of the hybrid basic condition. Actually, we have examples that you actually are really off where things will converge if you don't have that because the omega is not weakly. And then you can add robustness to that. And I'm sorry that I'm running out of time, but the idea is as follows, is because now we have this epsilon closest on compact hybrid time domains, um, what we can do is to tolerate mismatches on the impact times. Okay, so pick the bouncing ball again, one impact at this time, another one impacts a little bit later. Now, what we can allow is perturbations on the flow set and on the jump set, so let me just say what the perturbation would be. It would be given by a function of rho of x that would basically inflate the sets. So those would be inflations of those sets, while the dynamics would be inflated, but in a complexified manner. So basically the argument gets inflated and the values get inflated. Okay. But let's say that this is a perturbation of my system. So I start with a nominal, I perturb it, and now I would like to know if I have some properties of the nominal, what happened to the perturb? Okay. So and this is the last result I have. If a compact set is asymptotically stable for hybrid system H to satisfy the hybrid basic conditions, then there exists a small rho function perturbation such that A is a semi-global practical asymptotically stable set in the sense of giving a compact set of initial conditions and a level of closeness to the set A, then for some perturbation function, I will, I will uh, be able to attain that. My solution started from that compact set under the perturbation will, will converge to the same particular, to a neighborhood of the set A. So that's what I have planned. There are other consequences of these, like converse Lyapunov theorems and whatnot. I will skip some of these ideas. And good news is that these are implemented somehow and work. Um, so this is our first experiment and maybe only. Um, 
that actually made the juggling device follow the time of the component. There are applications for neurons. I uh, mentioned to you that the spiking <coughs> neurons is something that's very interesting as well. And uh, this is all I had. Um, there are a lot of open problems, in particular in optimality and stabilization of systems on manifolds that um, are open for grabs. And uh, thank you for your attention. Hybrid PDE is widely open. I've <coughs> seen one paper about that. Mm -hmm. um, you need to deal with jumps on 